Are you looking to up your real estate investing game? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Sub 2 Deal Show with your host, Sub 2 expert, William Tingle. Hey, Sub 2ers. My name is William Tingle of Sub2Deals.com. I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Sub 2 Deal Show, where we talk about all things subject to. Uh, occasionally, we'll cover some other real estate investing topics, but it will always be something to help you with your real estate investing business. Now, today we have a very special guest, Mr. Casey Constantine. Let me give you a little bit of background on my relationship with Casey. I met Casey in 2006. Uh, I was my fifth or sixth year into being an investor, and somehow I stumbled on his blog. Now, some of you guys that have been around for a while may remember uh, Casey's blog. He had a blog titled I'm Facing Foreclosure.com, and uh, it's where he pretty much laid out um, uh, what was happening with him. He had bought several properties in California uh, in, at the height of uh, the real estate boom. And, and subsequently, what happened? Uh, you know, he had gotten a little bit of training here and there, been to some seminars, some boot camps and things, and uh, had just really jumped out and started doing some stuff. Got to applaud him for taking action. I loved his blog. I loved his, uh, his just sense of, of just laying it all out there for everybody. There were really a lot of lessons learned. But, you know, I know he took a lot of grief from doing that. I know, uh, actually, <laughs> his... His blog was where I became familiar with the term haters. Uh, the haters. <laughs> uh, I think he, you actually spelled it with a Z, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, just uh, But yeah, because so many people just, for some reason, just just piled on him. It was it was amazing. But but I always thought he seemed like a really honest guy, and uh, you know, was just trying to make the best of the situation he found himself in. I think I actually, for a little while, was a a. Uh, uh, not a subscriber, but uh, actually a sponsor on the blog. I think I had an ad that we ran on there. Thank you for that. Uh, and subsequently got a little bit of, of the, the overflow haters <laughs> from being a sponsor. But but it was all good. And actually, I think I picked that phrase up from Casey, too. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, so, uh, so and, I, and I still use that today, as a matter of fact. But anyway, Casey and I have been friends on Facebook for a while. And... Um, He's recently joined the Sub2 Forum and uh, is a little bit interested. I actually, I had him out to a, one of the boot camps that I did in Macon, and he came out and met a few of the folks. But he's here today to talk to us a little bit about uh, his experiences in the crash, you know, with COVID happening right now and everything that's happening in the economy. And it's been a while, you know, so, and these things tend to fall cycles. Uh, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. I thought he'd be a great guy to have on and talk a little bit about his experiences. So I'd like to welcome you, Casey, to the Sub2 Deal Show. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, uh, it's an honor. Uh, it's been great knowing you all this time. So listen, let's uh, let's get going. We're going to, we'll get to the real estate stuff. But first, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, what you did before real estate and your family. Yeah, I'm originally from uh, the former Soviet Union country of Uzbekistan used to be a Republic of uh, USSR. So we grew up in a Russian family and um, came over to the United States at the age of uh, 11, 1994. And I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, so we came as a family and we have this American family who helped us get started and that's how we were able to immigrate. And there were our sponsors here. And the family is still close with us today and a uh, really, really good family. They helped us get uh, started and took us under their wing, so to speak. And because of that, we were able to get Americanized really fast. Um, and so um, I went to junior high school here in America and then high school. And it was pr pretty typical time for me. Um, it was a little bit difficult, I guess you can say, because coming over at 11, I wanted to fit in and so um, you know I didn't want to be an immigrant so <laughs> I tried to get rid of my accent really fast and I uh, tried to become uh, Americanized I didn't want to stand out uh, too much but, uh, but I did get assimilated fairly quickly and in, into the American culture and uh, to a point where I started to forget my original language Russian 
uh, and then uh, you know, years down the road, I ended up uh, brushing up on it and, and getting my fluency back. But at first, I started to forget it because I wasn't using it very much. Uh, anyhow, I graduated high school in year 2000. Uh, and um, around that time, that same year, a friend of mine gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, you know, that's the book that gets a lot of the entrepreneurs started. Uh, thank you to Robert Kiyosaki for bringing to the world a really, really transformational book and a series of books really that inspired a lot of us. And he broke it down in a really nice, simple language as to what to do for those of us who have the calling to achieve financial independence through passive income, real estate, business, investing, all of that. And I, I really, uh, it really spoke to me. That, that became my new goal, my new passion and, and uh, a desire to achieve this financial independence that was being talked about in this book. Uh, and it's been a 20 year journey. My goal hasn't changed in the last 20 years. I'm still on that same path. Um, and, uh, and actually I like the way you put it, uh, William, in your podcast, uh, one of the episodes you talked about the 12 houses plan, right? And the 12 houses plan sp spoke to me quite a bit too when I heard you mention it because it just makes it, um, it seems like a much more, you know, very attainable goal is just need 12 houses, $400 cash flow each, and you have your basic retirement income for the rest of your life and for your average family. And uh, I, I love that. I'm, I'm ready for the 12 houses. <laughs> well, you know, keeping it simple. And the reason I really did that was because so many of the newbies especially get caught up in these posts by people talking about buying 500 houses a year. Yeah. It seems like too big, just an even thing to, to dream of. And I said, well, think about it like this. The average family income is $56,000 a year. If you can buy 12 houses per year by, by the end of year three, and you keep those with owner financing, by the end of year three, you're making half a million dollars a year in income between down payments and, and monthly cash Cash flow is really where it's at. You know, you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I got started as an investor reading that book, too. I had a Carlton Sheets course and a Rich Dad, <laughs> Poor Dad book. And, uh, I mean, it really changes your way of thinking. It really changes the wiring. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, uh, I did Carlton Sheets as well. Uh, further down the, the story, uh, I, you know, I ended up buying um, a condo. My first property, I bought at age 19. And that was before I really got into learning about real estate and investing. That was just, uh, my parents bought a house around that time. And I thought, hey, maybe I can do the same. I had a pretty good tech job straight out of high school. So I was able to qualify for an FHA mortgage, zero down payment. Uh, and I was able to buy this, uh, this condo. I needed a little bit of work. Uh, so I did the work with my dad. And it was zero down deal. Even got $5,000 credit for uh, repairs. And in those days, uh, you were able to get cash back at close <laughs> on a purchase. Now it's a little harder to do something like that. So it was a, a fairly good uh, first uh, step there because it showed me the creativity of real estate, how you can structure things differently. And that was through a real estate agent, and she was pretty, uh, pretty savvy too. So that was a good experience. But then further down the road is when I got really interested after flipping that condo, reselling it and making $35,000 gain in one year, mostly through appreciation and also a little bit through, um, you know, sweat equity, because I did do a little bit of work to, to fix it up and update it. Uh, so I made 35,000 uh, on that sale. And that was as much as I was making at my uh, computer job at, at the time. And so my eyes really opened up uh, to the power of real estate and appreciation. And that's when I started, um, I'm interested in learning more about it. And um, I saw Carlton Sheets and commercial and bought the course and learned uh, all about that. And then I got into some other seminars. There was a big uh, national company, uh, Russ Whitney, and he was doing a lot of seminars in those days. Um, kind of like Fortune Builders is nowadays, uh, kind of a similar format with the weekend boot camps and, and additional upsells and things like that. Spend way too much money on education, uh, but, it got me enough, uh, you know, it's still an investment. I don't regret uh, all of that because it got me into um, the knowledge that was needed in order to give me some confidence. And then it was, it was really tempting to keep learning. And, and a lot of investors, new investors fall into that. 
but I did go ahead and take some action. Um, and so um, that's, that's how I got started. Yeah. So uh, what the, you said the condo, so I guess that's really what got you into real estate. You just, your parents bought the house and you said, Hey, maybe I can do this. You go out, you buy the condo. But uh, that's what really got you kicked off into real estate was that was your first deal. Yeah, and that was just for a primary residence, um, uh, but it was it was a good experience to own something uh, in at an early age because it got me uh, into the mindset of an owner of real estate versus renting. And before that, uh, I did rent for a little bit, but after high school, I moved out of my parents' house pretty quickly at age 18, right when I graduated. And um, so I rent, rented a, because I had a pretty good uh, tech job right up, uh, right out of high school with a dot-com company back in those days during the dot-com uh, boom. And um, so I, I thought I'll just buy a personal residence uh, because I was able to qualify, uh, might as well. And, um, and I'm, I'm glad I did. Okay, so, so you, bought, you bought the condo and uh, you fixed it up and you, you were in California, though that was in the Los Angeles area, is that right? Uh, Sacramento, I've, I've been in the Sacramento area ever since 1994 when I immigrated over here from the former Soviet Union. And I've moved around here and there, but mostly just stayed in the Sacramento area this entire time for the last uh, you know, 26 years or so. The condo I bought for $100,000, it was a three bedroom, one and a half bath condo in year 2000. Two, so twenty, so two thousand two. Then I sold in two thousand three um, for like a hundred and fifty. Then after you know costs and things, I, I think I made like thirty five. And then during this time, I lost my tech job because the dot com company I was working for uh, closed with the dot com crash. As one of the many companies that didn't make it through the through the crash, and uh, so I thought I'll do a little bit of freelancing and try to do my own thing and. I did some website design here and there, and um, I even started a little uh, little hosting operation where I would uh, charge my website clients for website hosting, and I would resell some server space to them and made a little bit of a spread on it. And so that was kind of my first attempt at building some passive income. Um, and so it, it was good. It got my feet wet with, with business and, and entrepreneurship, uh, but it wasn't taken off like I, I was hoping. And so... Uh, the money I made on the sale of the condo I was using it to live on. Um, I wish I reinvested that and got really uh, more savvy with real estate investing at that time. Maybe learn about subject two. In those days, would have been great to learn about it, but I didn't. So I just lived off the money, and I got married young too, at age 21. So that money paid for some of that as well. And then after I got married, um, that was my first wife. We, we both were kind of interested in doing something with real estate. She might have been actually the one that saw the, uh, the late night infomercials and told me about it. Uh, but we, we both got, went to the seminars. And, um, but then uh, it was time to take action. And I decided to go ahead and just um, uh, get into trying to wholesale. So that was my first attempt was, was wholesaling. Uh, and I quickly saw that uh, generating leads, uh, you know, it takes some effort and, and marketing dollars. And so it's not like you can do wholesaling with absolutely no budget. You still need a little bit of money to invest, even if it's banded signs and things like that. Um, and so I, I messed around with the wholesaling a little bit, wasn't getting a lot of traction. And then I remembered how I, I've bought a condo before by simply getting a mortgage. So I thought, you know what, instead of, wholesaling these deals, maybe I'll try to do uh, a flip myself because I kind of already did a flip before with the condo. So I, I had a little bit of knowledge about it, uh, but not that much. Well, flipping isn't uh, as easy as maybe some of the TV shows will <laughs> make it seem like. I found out real quickly that there's just a lot more moving pieces to it. Now, I have had some successful flips but because I've made uh, some successful flips early on, it's kind of like going gambling. And you, when you, if you win at the beginning, you might get a little too hooked because you got the taste of money, and then um, and then you may not have have the, the the skill to really do it properly. But uh, you know, but you remember how easy the first one and the second one was, so you expect the rest of them to be the same. And that's kind of what happened with me, and because I ultimately ended up buying. Eight houses in 2006. So you bought eight houses that year, and each one 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but each one you actually went out and got a mortgage to buy. Um, yeah, I bought them all with, with my own financing. Um, uh, most of them were uh, just me getting a mortgage. And, um, and then I think one, maybe one or two of them, I, I got a hard money loan. Uh, but the down payment for the hard money loan came from the cash uh, back uh, that I received on, I think, getting some of the, one of the other uh, mortgages. Uh, so the entire thing uh, was done, uh, if you want to say zero down, uh, because I was able to get 100% uh, financing on a primary residence. In those days, that was really to get. And then I structured the deal in such a, or, or I was buying them in such a way that I, I was buying two or three of them simultaneously. And I mean, the, the story is already out there, but I, I think I, I might have called uh, two of them my primary mortgage at the same time. <laughs> and that was not really a way for the Meg to see that uh, I was buying more than one of these. And so uh, I was able to get 100% that way. And that's part of the criticism I received is I kind of told people that in those days, it was really easy to just um, state your income. There's these loans that were called uh, liar loans. That's because uh, <laughs> they you kind of just get away with putting down whatever income you'd like to put down there. There wasn't much checks and balances on that like it is now. And so I, you know, I did what I can and I might have pushed the envelope a little bit with trying to get as much financing as I possibly can in the shortest amount of time. And that was uh, part of uh, kind of the story I brought forth later on as to the mistakes I've made that allow me to get so much leverage so quickly. Right. So you, you were actually purchasing these homes off of the MLS, is that right? Actually, it was a combination of things. So some were off the MLS, um, and some of, the, some of them was me uh, starting to apply some of the creative buying techniques for finding motivated sellers. So I did, um, do, I did buy some leads on the internet, some motivated seller leads. Uh, the internet leads were just getting started in those days. This was 2006. Uh, and uh, but they were already available, and so using those, I was able to get through to some of the sellers and negotiate um, negotiate deals directly. In fact, I think my very first uh, flip in 2006 that was actually a, a, a pretty smooth, successful flip uh, that I did, where I made thirty thousand in about two months, um, was off a motivated seller lead that I bought through the internet. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of spread, but I was still able to make it, uh, make a quick flip, flip through it. Um, it was before the real estate crash began. It, it might have been maybe a couple of months before the crash. Uh, so, but but your profit on these things was really largely due to appreciation. Is that, is that right? Uh, the condo was appreciation, the, the one I bought in 2002 and sold in 2003. So I held it for a year. But all of the deals in 2006, when I really started to try to do uh, flipping, was uh, actually just flipping, buying low, selling high. Problem is I didn't buy all that low. I was so eager to get into these deals because I wanted to prove to myself that I didn't just blow, you know, 15 grand on education for nothing. You know, I wanted to <laughs> actually... If, pay myself back for that investment because a lot of it I financed with credit cards and, and things. And so that's one of the, uh, one of the questions you have further on, but we can touch on that. Some of the mistakes are, uh, I think new investors make as while there's the, uh, there's the not taking action uh, and spending too much time in learning phase. And then there's taking uh, action. That's maybe a little too impulsive because you're just too eager to be, uh, call yourself a real estate investor. <laughs> oh, that's right. I agree. So, so, you, so one of the lessons that we've learned from this is that you have to buy right. You make your money when you buy the house, not when you sell it. That makes sense. Right. That that you know your your profits really made when you purchase it. I mean, if you're if you're, I mean, now we routinely in sub two, if if our model is to go out and buy houses subject to and sell it with seller financing, you know, which is kind of contradictory to your situation, but. You were trying to re buy retail and sell retail, but we can buy houses and pay practically full price for them and make money on the interest spread and a little bit of markup because we're selling the seller financing. But you were paying basically full price for a house and then trying yeah, to make it and sell it. Yeah, I was trying to get them wholesale, but um, because I was spending uh, the, the time to do the proper uh, marketing, I, I was 
I wasn't really doing much marketing. I was just buying some online leads. So somebody else was doing the marketing and I was just buying the leads, which, you know, even those leads, uh, some of them were worth going after. Um, but um, again, I, I was too eager to get into the game. So I was willing to take deals with uh, small profit margins. Um, and the first one actually worked out well. I bought it for, um, I think, forget the numbers, but wherever it is, I, I bought it and then I, did a, just a little bit of cleanup on the inside. It was mostly, um, it was mostly, there wasn't much repairs to do. It, it was mostly just a cleanup job. And then I put it on the MLS. And so I resold it. I wasn't an agent at the time. I, did, I wasn't licensed. I did get a license uh, uh, years later. Um, but in, in 2006, I, I would just use uh, those flat fee listing services where I think for a $500, for a 500 bucks, I was able to, put the property on the market, uh, kind of like a for sale by owner, but it, uh, there's these flat fee brokers that will actually list it for you. And then uh, the buyers will call me direct and they don't offer any representation. It's like a, a, a limited service uh, deal. And so I was just able to uh, eke out a, a quick 30,000 on that first deal, uh, just buying and reselling, uh, basically retailing, um, like a quick flip. And then I ended up using that money to buy another property, but that one wasn't as good of a deal. It required a lot more work. And because I didn't have quite the experience uh, in uh, construction, I underestimated the amount of repairs this was gonna take to really turn around. And so I kind of got stuck with that deal. It was taking longer to repair than I thought. And then in the meantime, I ended up buying uh, some other properties out of the area. And uh, some of the investors in Sacramento were going over to some of the other states because a lot of us were kind of, we, we saw the market look like it might have been topping, but uh, other states seemed like there was still deals to be had there and maybe there was more time uh, before the market would peak out there. So some of us went over to the New Mexico market and uh, were able to find some deals. So I bought a property in Albuquerque, New Mexico around the same time. Uh, and then I ended up that same year ended up buying a property in Salt Lake City, Utah area, uh, kind of the suburbs of uh, Salt Lake. Uh, and I, I actually bought two properties in, I just remembered, in New Mexico, Albuquerque. Uh, so I was, I was kind of all over the place. Um, and uh, that, that's another mistake I made is trying to do flips remotely just because the deal seemed good. And I underestimated, the, you know, the, the back and forth and the and everything that is required and, and fi finding a local contractor and trusting that they'll do a good job. And there's just a lot of moving pieces trying to do things outside the market. Right. You were trying to learn a, to do a whole lot of things at one time. So I'm sure that. Yeah. One time, yeah. <laughs> so, so you had a couple of successful flips in the beginning and then you bought several houses there. And it seemed like that's what kind of when you were moving around state to state, you bought several houses all at one time, and that's kind of when things started falling apart, didn't it? Yeah, exactly. I just took on way too much upon myself doing things in, in multiple markets at the same time, and then um, underestimated some of the repairs, didn't buy low enough to create enough of a profit margin. So a lot of the newbie mistakes, but I made them all at the same time. So it's kind of a, a recipe for disaster, if you will. And uh, I was trying to float these mortgages because I took out per financing on, you know, I financed all of these with these, uh, I guess you can say subprime loans because I, I didn't really care about the interest rate. I just wanted to get 100% um, financing. And, and on a lot of them, I was able to structure a cash back at close. So I purchased it. I was able to get some money uh, back uh, towards repairs and things. And so that floated the whole um, situation for a little bit. And then I realized I'm paying out $20,000 a month in mortgages and utilities. And this can only sustain for a few more months, a couple of more months, really. Uh, I had a really short burn rate before this was all going to collapse, unless I was able to flip everything quickly. And that wasn't looking like it's happening. So then in, um, at the end, uh, in September 2006 is when I realized um, I'd say about August of 2006, I realized this this is all going to collapse. I'm not going to be able to turn us around. It was a pretty clear realization. And I, for some reason, had this desire came to me to share the story. 
because I remember all of these and other uh, wannabe investors, you know, people that want to wanted to get into this game would go to these courses. And some of these courses had huge, uh, you know, classes and, and, you know, I think one of them made it like a couple of hundred people in, in a class that uh, they were real popular in those days. There's a lot of seminars being offered. And so thousands of people are learning the strategies and I'm sure I wasn't the only one making some of these mistakes. So I thought, uh, I want to share the story and maybe it'll help somebody. So I started a blog uh, called, and I registered a domain and simply called it IamFacingForeclosure.com for the lack of a better term. And that ended up being actually a great name because it basically described the story and it was a hook. So people wanted to see, well, is, is he going to be able to get out and what's the deal? And so I shared the story really candidly, really openly about how I got into the mess, how I bought uh, basically eight homes in, in like eight months. So I bought a one house a month, uh, just just um, out of just exuberance, thinking that I'll be able to handle it all. And, and then talked about some of the ways I financed it through these uh, through these mortgages. And, and in those days, the, the loose lending guidelines, or I really... You know, take a, took advantage of, of how easy it was to get all this financing and uh, ended up getting really over leveraged and uh, facing foreclosure. And the rest of the, uh, the, the blog from that point on just documented my life uh, on a daily basis. And that's what made it really interesting as I was telling people about, you know, how these, I was already defaulting on, on payments. So I was talking about what the lenders were doing. If I get like a notice in the mail, I'd put it on the internet, show people, okay, here's, Here's an, uh, a foreclosure notice. Here's what it looks like. So it really showed the reality, uh, the reality of, uh, I guess the reality TV uh, or, or the blog was uh, the, the actual in the trenches of what it's like to be, for, you know, being foreclosed on and then find, looking for ways out of it. I, I tried to do my best to, to do short sales, which were hard to do in those days. Tried to do loan modifications. Again, those were kind of hard to do because I was just starting uh, and um, just doing, finding, looking for creative ways to get out of the mess. Uh, and then the story also then began to encompass some of my personal life. Uh, I was also facing divorce, not just facing foreclosure uh, with my first marriage. We didn't have any kids, so it was, it was a, a, a more of a simple situation. Uh, but uh, I, I really wanted to save the marriage because uh, we started real estate investing together but she was really upset with how much risk I was taking on and I was uh, buying houses left and right. And she felt like we were going a little too fast. She wanted me to put, put on the brakes a little bit. And I was all about the gas pedal to the metal. And so we had that conflict in personality and we were pretty young, you know, we're, we're both 21. And so we didn't maybe have as much maturity um, in order to, to really handle our differences and our conflicts. And, uh, and then when the publicity came with the blog, the blog got picked up by the mainstream media, by the way, real quickly. Within a month, I was, within a month of me starting, I got an interview request from the San Francisco Chronicle and the USA Today on the same day. I remember that day. So two top tier media, uh, you know, outlets wanted to interview my story uh, or, you know, interview me for the story. And then after that, for about a year, I kept getting more and more publicity around, over the same story. But it was it was the perfect story for the time because we're just getting started with with the real estate crash and the media was looking for examples of people that um you know to make sort of like uh, an example out of why this whole thing's happening so i became the perfect poster child for the whole mess because i was so open about what i did and how i did it uh, and the speculative uh, speculation side of it and played into it and so it the story i guess just blew up and um, and then it affected my marriage in a pretty negative way too, because she, she was very private. My first wife was very private and she didn't want any of this shared with the world. But, um, but the readers of the blog were really curious about how this was affecting my marriage. And I started to share that a little bit and how it's putting a lot of stress on it. And, and, um, <clears throat> and then just things can get, getting more and more, uh, involved. And she eventually decided to, um, to go ahead and, file for divorce uh, and that really rocked my world and then I remember going on the Dr. Phil show that was one of the one of the highlights of you know some of the shows I got to be on and that, and that was a really cool experience in of itself but anyway uh, long story short Dr. Phil told me that uh, well 
because um, you know his his thing is about relationships and entrepreneurship that was the segment i was on the show I was on and so i was talking about how my entrepreneurship drive got to be a little too much of a drive to where it was affecting my marriage i was i was in conflict with with my spouse about how we would go about the entrepreneurship and so he said well if you want to keep the marriage you got to got to put more priority on it and if she wants you to be off the internet that's what you have to do um and so so then that's when i decided around that time to go ahead and shut down the blog i was getting way too much publicity at that time a lot of the publicity was really negative and and so i was taking a lot of my time and emotions to handle it all so i thought i'll, I'll go ahead and shut it down uh, and then see if I can maybe get my uh, my wife back. She didn't she didn't want to come back, uh, so I ended up losing the blog and the wife. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, it was time to do that. The Sub Two Deals Show with your host, Sub Two Expert William Tingle. We'll be right back. Hey, sub tours. Do you want to learn how to get the deed, but need a little help getting started? Want to learn how to fill out the paperwork, how to use a land trust, how to market for deals, how to negotiate with sellers and more? Join us in the sub two deals, Facebook coaching group, get the benefits of one-on-one -on -one coaching without the big price tag. Learn to do sub two right with coaching in a group setting and mastermind format. Head over to sub two deals.com right now and click on consulting and group coaching. We'll save you a seat. Back to the show, the Sub Two Deal Show, with your host, Sub Two Expert William Tingle. I uh, I know. I mean, it was it was really an incredible incredible story. I know when I when I found your blog, I was struck just by how honest you were. I mean, just like you, <laughs> you said, you know, you you got a foreclosure notice, you posted it on there, you talked very openly about you know your wife and your situation with that. And I mean, it was it was really. I mean, it was hard to read at times. I mean, you you're dealing with all that stuff, but you know, it's just an example, you know, of several examples. Number one is when people ask me all the time, how will, you know, you get anybody to sign a house over for you? I'm going to venture to say that if someone had approached you and said, hey, I'll take this house from you. If you'll just sign the deed over to me, I'll make the payments. You would have probably been very open to that. Am I right? Well, let me, let me speak to that, actually. So one of the properties I sold is I, uh, this one was the one in Utah. I, um, I couldn't get out of it by just putting it on the market and, and retailing it because um, I didn't buy it low enough. And then uh, I tried to do some repairs, but I already was running out of money. So it, was, it still needed work. Uh, and so I actually sold it. The way I was able to sell it is through seller financing. So I was the one that uh, offered the idea for someone to take over my payments. So I knew a little bit about uh, seller financing because of all the courses I've taken. Uh, and, and also the idea of uh, buying subject to. So this particular property, we sold it on a wraparound mortgage or uh, all-inclusive trust deed is the more technical term because it's a trust deed state. Uh, it's basically a wrap. And so that was a really cool experience to be the seller on a wrap. And I was definitely the motivated seller. So I started off learning by what it's like to buy from motivated sellers. But through my adventures, I became the motivated seller with you know multiple properties facing foreclosure. And if someone came to me to take over on payments, I would have been quite happy to just hand it over. Here you go. I'll sign the deed over, take over my payments. Problem is uh, the mortgages I took out in order to do these flips, I was only thinking short term. So I was willing to take the higher interest rate in order to get a seller, uh, I'm sorry, in order to get uh, the lender credits to cover my closing costs. As, as some of us know, if you take a higher credit, the, the lender will usually give you a uh, a little rebate on taking a higher rate. And so I took some really high rates in order to have zero closing costs. And so my mortgage payments were higher than most people would want would have wanted to uh, take over, uh, except for this one in Utah still made sense for one buyer. And then so they, we wrapped the payments to where their payments to me were exactly what my underlying payments were. So I wasn't making any of us any spread on it, but I was just happy to have one of the many properties I was dealing with, uh, you know, off the table and not, not to worry about it anymore. And, um, and then after a year of making uh, payments, they went ahead and refinanced me out. And so at least I was able to sell one of the problem properties through a creative uh, wraparound. So the owner finance situation worked well for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so that actually showed me uh, by being in the, in the shoes of the motivated seller, 
that this was a very, very good strategy. And I wasn't afraid to propose it because I myself have seen the benefit of it. Uh, and while I haven't really gotten into subject to investing much since then, I am just now finally, you know, all these years later, uh, getting, getting into it now. I'm starting to do some marketing and um, I actually uh, just picked up uh, your course as well. Even though I learned it many years ago, I, I want to get a refresher. And so um, really good course. Uh, and uh, I'm just starting with it. And then, of course, I've been listening to the podcast and you offer a, a lot of great info on your podcast for free. And, and it's just such a such a great thing. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that case. Uh, thanks for being a listener. Of course. <laughs> uh, so so tell me this. What uh, the takeaway here? I mean, you got started in real estate investing. You were excited about it. You ran out. You, you did some stuff. You're in a, a great appreciating market. Uh, 2005, six. <laughs> Uh, and and then the market started coming down. Of course, we always know the markets that appreciate the fastest are the first ones to fall. Uh, and you were in California, so you bought properties. Uh, you paid a little too much for them. You weren't able to flip them, resell them, and and get them moved. So subsequently, ultimately, how many you had six or seven that were foreclosed on? Yeah, I ended up actually losing five homes to foreclosure. Uh, out of the eight I bought in 2006, um, two of them I flipped, one I made. Uh, so the two that were successful flips, I made 30000 on one, and then about 5000 if that, on another. So mostly a break-even property in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and then the one in Utah, I, I just had someone take over payments. So I really didn't do all that well. It was mostly a train wreck. Um, I got just a taste of what it's like to do a quick flip and make the, you know, the fast cash. But then I got uh, into the other ones. Um, and, um, and then the ones I lost, of course, wiped out whatever profits I made on, on the one or two successful flips went into the other ones. And so all in all, um, even though I didn't start with any money, I, so I, I guess I, I can say I didn't really lose any money because it was all 100% financing. And then I took out some credit credit cards too and, and cre uh, credit lines in order to fund some of the repairs. Um, I My credit was ruined, so um, so I, that took me out of the game for a while. Um, at least I couldn't do it with financing anymore. Well, you know, there are so many ways to buy real estate though with no financing. I mean, there are lease options, obviously, subject to, uh, and some other things. So, I mean, you're you're definitely not out of the game. Or we're going to teach you the way to, to do this stuff. Yeah, in some in some ways, it's good that I, um, you know, I went through this. Everything I went through, you know, I, I I can say I made all these mistakes, but course I don't regret the mistakes they there are some really valuable lessons and perhaps that's the only way I could have learned is I needed to learn through the painful process um, you know those of you who can learn from other people's mistakes more power to you but some of us have to go through the pain <laughs> that's right. and so so I got to see what it's like to be a motivated seller I got to see what it's like to have my re uh, credit ruined so then um, you know that that gave me an appreciation or, or at least a sympathy for anyone who is in the same boat. So now when I talk to motivated sellers or people facing foreclosure, I can literally tell them, hey, look, I've been in your shoes and actually not with just one home, but with five homes or like, you know, a bunch of homes at the same time. So, so I, you know, I, I knew that you would be a great person to have on because of the relevance of what you went through in the crash. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, this COVID thing going on right now and everything else. We don't really know what's going to happen, but we do know that real estate operates in cycles. You know, there's a, a trending a peak and then, of course, you know, the, the slowdown and then and then the crash. And, and yeah. they vary, you know, the, the severity of them from one cycle to the next. Uh, but I think it's relevant. It's been a few years now. It's been uh, 14 years or so, and so statistically, it's time or getting close. Uh, so having you on here and talking about your experiences, I thought would be helpful. Based on the things that you went through, uh, what advice would you have for new investors who are just getting started and are interested in real estate? What would you share with them? Yeah, uh, if, if you're starting out as a new investor, 
Um, I think uh, getting some education is really good, um, but uh, you know, don't, don't let the lack of education or knowledge uh, keep you from taking action. So, but it's a fine balance, right? So, um, you know, I, I learned a few different strategies and then um, I felt like I wanted to keep learning uh, so I can have the whole, uh, you know, tool bag of different tools to have, uh, whether it's wholesaling or subject to or lease options and what have you. Thing is, you don't necessarily need to learn all of those. I think it's good to maybe learn one. Maybe it's wholesaling, maybe it's subject to, and, and apply, or at least begin to apply it so you can get some real world results and, and, then, and then keep learning at the same time. So it is important to take action. At the same time, when you're taking action, don't be like me where I went a little, a little overboard on the action. And you know, I, want, I was, I became, don't become a motivated buyer, you know. Deal with motivated sellers because that's where the deals are. So buy from motivated sellers, but don't be a motivated buyer. <laughs> and so I was a motivated buyer because I was so eager to get a piece of the action. Real, there was so much hype over real estate back in those days, the early 2000s, especially leading up to the crash 2004, 2005, and six. And then the crash started to begin in the late 2006, and then of course seven, eight, nine. And that's when we saw all the banks crash. And, so the crash went for a few years after that. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of euphoria that can happen when you're early in real estate investing. Uh, you just, you just, you know, you, especially if you spend some money on education, you really want to recoup that investment. You want to prove to yourself that uh, this, is, this is possible to do. And so those are all good feelings. Just keep those in check and, and uh, follow sound principles um, the other advice is get a mentor if possible. I didn't really have a mentor. Um, I, I did join a local real estate association and, and that I do recommend joining the local RIA, finding other uh, like-minded individuals or study groups. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of online resources like uh, Williams, uh, excellent su subject to sub two deals. Uh, Facebook forum is really, really great. I'm just starting to get involved in, in that. And, um, there's uh, nowadays, in, unlike 2006, there's tons of free content nowadays. Like in those days, seminars were kind of like the only way to go, uh, books, tapes, seminars, what have you. So you had to spend a lot more money in those days to get education. Nowadays, you can literally just um, spend maybe a few weeks listening to podcasts, maybe on your way to work. So you can integrate the education into your daily life and probably have enough to at least start to take some initial steps, try a little bit of marketing, you know, start to do actual, you know, instead of spending $10,000 on education, buy a quality course. Like William has a course for like 400 bucks, you know, that goes through the entire thing. That's $400 well spent, right? Versus spending $10,000 on a weekend bootcamp that feeds you all this info in three days, like a fire hydrant drinking out of a fire hydrant and you probably won't retain very much and then you you might and then they'll make you feel like you still need more and you, you got to keep buying more of their stuff so a lot of these uh, seminar companies out there they're really built uh to um i wouldn't say take advantage of the new investors but in a way they're really feeding into this idea of like of the desire to have this knowledge right now and so be careful with that you know don't overspend on education just Seek out, you know, a few good podcasts or free, a couple of good courses. So you have the concentrated education. You have some forms like what, uh, for example, subject, uh, sub2deals.com offers what, uh, what William has to offer for us. There's, uh, you know, a few other good ones out there. And that's how I would get started if I was to do it all, all over again. And then keep listening, keep uh, being plugged in, especially the motivational stories like what, uh, you know, you have William on uh, on your podcast, you have the investor series, and those are really, really inspirational just to hear from actual investors. And they tell you exactly what they do, and they tell you the strategies they use, and that information is invaluable, and you're just offering it. So it's such a such an abundance mentality you have. So I appreciate that very much. And that's how I would get started. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I mean, you, you, want, uh, you want enough information to be able to take action, and you want access to somebody who can help you through, you know, the rough spots, right. uh, you know, because you're, you're going to get caught up on different things. Uh, uh, you know, at the same time, you don't want to get into a situation where you're just constantly educating yourself and not actually. 
great advice, Casey. Hey, listen, we, man, we appreciate you so much for coming on today and talking about your story. You know, I know that's got to be hard to talk about in, in some way, uh, but I mean, you've always been so transparent with everything that was going on. I mean, like I said, that's one of the things that attracted me to your blog, and I was just amazed by it. So thanks for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would uh, maybe add if we have a little more time on onto the uh, my advice for people is I would, um, you know, if you have the the desire to and the opportunity to, I, I think uh, getting a real estate license is a is a good thing uh, because it will help you and and you can kind of combine the the wholesale approach if you will with the retail approach and, and it's nice to have those tools. It's nice to have access to the MLS. Uh, it's nice to learn the retail side of the business as well. So then you can network with other real estate agents. Uh, you can talk the talk, speak their language. Um, and so what happened with my story is after the foreclosures and the blog, um, I shut down the blog. I actually sold the blog and made uh, pretty good money just selling the domain. So that was like a nice silver lining out of this whole thing. And I used the money to pay down some debt. Then I took a few years off. I probably took uh, from 2000 seven to 2014 was just me doing other things. I did some traveling, uh, just working some different odd jobs and, and um, backpacking, couch surfing, you name it. So uh, it was, it was a time to, uh, to just kind of uh, transition and then heal from, from uh, trying to become an entrepreneur and making all these mistakes and all the pain I received and, and getting over the, getting over the, the whole divorce situation too. Uh, and then I learned a lot by doing that too. And just, just to take a break. Uh, but then in 2014, uh, while I was an Uber driver, uh, I was a full-time Uber driver for about a year and, and that was pretty fun. Uh, but in between, uh, dry, ri rides, uh, in between rides, I would pull over and open up a laptop and be studying for the real estate exam and, you know, just brushing up on the knowledge. And, and then I ended up, uh, going ahead and passing the real estate exam and I got my license in 2014 and, I, and that was my entry entrance back into real estate is is my heart was still in real estate even though I took a really long break from it uh, but so the way I got back into it is just by being a retail uh, doing the retail game being an agent working with buyers and sellers and that was really uh, really helpful because it showed me uh, gave me the experience and the mechanics of, of all those different transactions um, and, and then in 2016, I ended up getting a broker license um, uh, in California. You just need two years of experience and then you can get the license. And I think that was a really good step too, because as a real estate broker, now being kind of, uh, you know, at the top of the game, if you will, in the retail game, I can hire agents and things like that. And I'm actually starting to build a, a brokerage now. I have a couple of agents on board now. And so that just gives me more tools uh, and, and more credibility too. When I, um, so, you know, some of the real estate uh, uh, educators out there will will even discourage you from getting a license because they think it will be uh, actually uh, hurt you in your pursuits of you know wholesale deals and talking with motivated sellers. And that could be true maybe sometimes, but overall, I'd say it, it's been a, a benefit to me. Yeah, you have to disclose your license. But the way I do it is, is I disclose that I am licensed, so then I am held to a higher standard, you know. And so uh, I make that actually a strength, not a weakness. Uh, so those, those are my tips. I, I even got a loan license as well, too, now. So I can do, I have an MLO license, so I can originate mortgages. Um, and it's ironic from, you know, the, the guy that's known for, you know, the subprime mess and then the mortgage meltdown now. I'm actually, uh, you know, doing loans uh, and, uh, you know. It's uh, it came full circle, but uh, being being on the borrowing side and not being on the side of uh, of uh, originating loans, it, it gave me that experience from both angles, and and it just uh, added to my my set of tools that I can use. So I encourage, uh, I do encourage uh, getting a, a license uh, and even a loan license, because then when you're doing subject to deals, you can actually uh, do financing for your. Uh, for your buyers uh, to refi you out of your loans down the road. Um, that's what I'm planning to do. Well, that sounds great. Well, I, and I, you're still in the Sacramento area, correct? Yeah, I'm still in the Sacramento area. So if anyone's out here in Northern California uh, looking for a, an investor friendly real estate broker and mortgage broker, I'd be happy to, to hop out. I'm 
Uh, I love uh, doing joint venture type stuff and working together on deals. And I'm just starting to get back into investing myself. Um, and so it's been many years and I, I, I can't even call myself a true investor because back in those days, I was really just uh, more like a speculator um, slash wannabe flipper, if you will. But so anyway, after all these years, I'm kind of doing the retail game for a few years, doing just uh, real estate agent type work and doing some loans. Now I'm bringing my investing uh, side back into play and I'm looking forward to kind of just putting them all together into a nice little package. Hmm. So uh, tell, tell everybody how they would get in touch with you if they're looking to buy a house in the Sacramento area or get some financing or refinance on a house. Uh, yeah, you can um, reach out to me at, um, uh, through, through social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram uh, under my first and last name, Casey Constantine. And, um, and then you can, uh, I have caseyconstantine.com, my main website, which right now just links to my Zillow profile, but I think I have my contact information on there. Uh, and so you can just reach out that way. Okay, great. So, and also anybody uh, interested in, in investing, I know you're looking to network out there. I know you, we had a post uh, in the Sub2 Forum recently where oh, we actually got several uh, California investors in there on that. So. Uh, I know you're looking for people that are looking, you know, interested in investing as well to network. Yeah, exactly. I'd love to network anyone in the Sacramento area, San Francisco Bay area. Uh, feel free to reach out and uh, we can all learn together, do some deals together. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, thanks again, Casey, for, for coming on the show today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Sub tours. That's it for this episode of the sub two deal show podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode along with a complete transcript at sub2podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would subscribe and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute and it helps others discover the show. You can subscribe as well and leave a rating and review by visiting Apple Podcasts. And just do a quick search for the Sub2 Deal Show. Till next time, keep learning, keep talking to sellers, and you will buy some houses. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Sub 2 Deal Show with William Tingle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit sub2deals.com or on Facebook at Sub 2 Deals. We'll catch you next time.